David and Roy, welcome. I'm really excited to have you both. Um, I'm really excited to get your insights today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you be here. Oh, thank you. Uh, so what was the initial spark um, that ignited your activism? I mean, was it a long time ago? Was it recent? What made you actually act? Oh, Shauna. Um, I guess I can this, go first. Yeah. Um, I would say that um, my, a lot of my activism just started in the more passive, like in the more passive personal way of just like, getting into arguments and debates with people in my life, following things online and like watching all these conflicts happening. And then, you know, being dramatic, publicly dramatic with my friends and family as like, that was like level one. <laughs> right. And then um, once I get, once I got comfortable enough with the idea that, you know, you can be dramatic and your friends and family can, they can handle that and you can navigate those, that part of your, those relationships started, looking to the outside world. Um, I mean, I find protests are so empowering. I was in Quebec during the, um, uh, their huge 2012 protest movement. And there's something really perspective shifting about standing in a protest that has 200,000 people. Like it really shifts your mind of what is actually possible with people power. Like, and that protest led to a, a majority government, you know, call an election early right like so there is the sense of power that can come from direct action um uh, but i would say when it comes to like starting ground up which was more of my organizing efforts where i was trying to like okay how do i build something together so that happened in the um december of 2020 we were like what if we just started publicly trying to organize and publicly trying to rebel rouse and you know do what we do we're doing in our private lives in a public way so my friend and i started the account to, you know start call, naming things that need to be named and saying things that need to be said and putting pressure uh, and thinking about like pressure points for elected officials or for journalists or for whoever um and then that's when our first opportunity for our first rally came about because um, I am from within Waterloo. I'm from Waterloo region, and it's an interesting space, right? Because there's parts of it are super urban, very like Toronto vibes, but then it's not far to the suburban life, and then these like semi suburban, semi rural communities. So I, I grew up in, and I was living in one of these called Baden, which is at the edge of the city, and I think mean, the mayor of Baden was blatantly white supremacists would post white lives matter rallies or white Lives matters content on their mayoral thing and and no one else in the government system could hold them any accountable at all and there was local indigenous people who were trying to raise awareness out sir john and mcdonald and so tried to take team with them to support their work and learning how to be a supportive person and then once um, we heard that there was going to be a uh, like a White Lives Matter rally in the community, starting to mobilize things to be like, okay, we know the Indigenous organizers uh, organizers are exhausted. We know the Black organizers are exhausted. This is right here in our community. Like we just need to do something. And and once learning doing that and learning from that, and then from there the ball was far gone. Like you know, we're already now at council meetings. We're already now making public letters, we're already now organizing rallies and you just learn lessons and stumble forward. So I would say that's the progression. Wow. Thank you for that. Roy, how about you? Um, I Thank you for asking me the question because I try to go back in time to when I was like young and what really did it. I think, first of all, I think I was blessed with an imagination because you have to believe there's going to be something better. You know, I was a young, fat, queer kid in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario going, this is shit. But look at what's on TV. Look at what they did. So I was like, like in rural, um, small town in northern Ontario, I didn't have any sense of justice. I just had a sense, get out of here and do good things somewhere else. Because you, I had an imagination and thank God that was part of it, right? And then I, I remember once my mother, like, like we were working class and my mother got some money from my grandfather to build new cupboards in the kitchen. And oh my God, we were going to have a microwave. We were going to have like overhead lighting. We we're going to have all this shit. Really exciting. The whole family was in it. 
And the guy came and did the shoddiest job he had ever done. And my mother was devastated. Here's this, you know, woman who doesn't have much of an education. She had this dream of a beautiful kitchen. And then she said, Roy, can you go and tell him what he did wrong? And I was going, holy shit. My mother, who is a tough cookie, you know, Italian housewife, cannot face this white man who, you know, was connected to the family. That's why he got the job. He was a friend of a friend of a father. She put me out to tell him everything he did wrong. And God, I felt powerful. I felt like I'm sticking up for my mom. I'm telling a big, you know, asshole of a man what to do right. I didn't know the first thing about woodwork, but here I am a woodwork expert, right? So that was like, really, I tried to think of the first thing, right? And then when I went to school, I read a lot of Bertolt Brecht because I was studying theater, right? And I thought, oh my God, here's this guy writing plays, putting them on anywhere and actually sending a message and do it using theater to educate people. I was, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, and I started reading about environmental theater and the Worcester group and all these people that live together to create theater to change the world. I thought, that's me. That's what I'm going to do. I never did that. Um, and then, I, I mean, I came to Toronto and Toronto was like my life force. Toronto was the good medicine I needed as a queer kid. And I came into Toronto when AIDS was happening and there was activism there. I was like protesting for my life with all these wonderful queer people. Um, I was finding my voice. I was learning from all these people and connecting the dots. It was exciting, right? Um and then I think for this last one, the last protest kind of that led up to all this was um, during these Save the Children hate rallies that were happening across Canada. The last one was October 21st. I I had this idea and it always comes from a spark. I, I remember talking to this artist from Copenhagen and he said what he did, he brought his easel into the government house where all the politicians were meeting and he started to paint them. It freaked them out. So I organized something like that in Toronto, where we had an art drawing class outside of municipal of uh, the city hall. Then we all went in with our our boards and we drew it. And then we had a show at a gallery of all these, you know, characters, the drawings of council. So here's people learning about municipal politics. Actually, for a lot of them, it was the first time to know they could go into the chamber. They could see this. They could participate. And then they had a, we had a show. And of course, I don't know if anybody out there knows Giorgio Mammoliti, but he was like, the Italian stallion in parliament. He showed yeah. up to the art show that e that afternoon thinking he was going to meet a chick or something. I don't know. He pulled up on his bicycle. He had all in black with a t-shirt that said Gucci. And everybody was going, fuck, you know, like we have achieved something here. <laughs> so I always think that if you, for me, the spark, the energy is creating joy in the protests. And it's hard and it's not always possible but if you can have people see that they're enjoying themselves, then that's important. And not platforming the hate, like stay away from it. So what we had in here last month was we had an art in where people were told, come, we'll gather. We won't be right in front of the haters. We'll be drawing art. We'll be making, drawing each other, drawing whatever we want. Some people brought poetry. And we all sat around. We had a better place than the haters. They were like on the road where cars whizzed by them. We found a stop sign. People had to stop. We had we were laughing. They were they were we had lots of rainbows. We we said we only want three messages. Don't come with like you know love is love or any of that BS. I did we didn't say that. We said here's some suggested signs you might want to put, and they did, and people loved it. And from that we're growing into a movement. We're growing into like local community because I think there's a real need to organize. But that's what it okay okay. <laughs> So that's, I think that kind of answered the spark and where it led to. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that leads great uh, segue into, okay, so both of you are passionate and you have found that spark. How do you <clears throat> ignite that spark in other people? So how do you, how do you encourage, engage, um, make them show up? Basically, how, how do you do that? What is there a secret sauce? I mean, I think fundamentally, like people do care. And like, so there, like, I don't think it's necessarily about making people care. Because there are wherever you are, there are people who care. It's just there's a sense of, you know, we don't have a lot of literacy on where do you go next. And especially like, <laughs> making change means fundamentally like taking risks 
Like it's fundamentally about disrupting whatever the status quo is. And so if you're in a culture, you know, taking risks is a big thing, right? And if you don't know how to take risks and, and, uh, um, and, and what are the next steps? I think people get really lost in there. Like you, know, you can, you, cause you don't want to screw up. You don't want to cause more harm and you don't want to be alone. Right. And so that's where I think as soon as someone <laughs> like you know as soon as someone once you've taken a risk you know how to do it and, and so like when you when you show people and you're able, you're like hey i this like you know i'm gonna go do that first initial risk and i will put it out there and let you all know you know people will then flock to that because they want to make a difference and they want to learn how and so i even think of you know that like we did not have to try hard to get people to come out to our actions and what we found is like ground up, I mean, it started just me and my friend. And now it's, I would say a network of 75 to 90 people who, um, and the majority, vast majority of them, not experienced advocates. They came and they were like, we just, I, I, I want to help. And you were, you're giving me the tools to help. And now I, I want to tap into this so I can learn from you. And, you know, I will go have my first delegation with, you know, and you'll teach like, and then I'll do it with you. And then I'll feel more comfortable to do that the next time. Or, um, you're teaching me about marshalling and you know, I will then, you know, I can now, now I know, and now I have the tools. So I just think it's really, you know, the hardest part is finding someone like finding people who have the capacity to take those first initial risks. Um, and so, um, cause you need someone to blaze that forward. And then once that's there, I think it's just creating the opportunity for all those people then to then learn from that and to take that next step with you. What about you, Roy? Yeah, I, I, I totally um, echo what David said. And I think too, it's, it's, it's always um, building the momentum, right? How do you build the momentum? Because like, what do you do after you have a wonderful rally? Like, what do you do with all these people? How do you make them feel they're, they're accomplishing something? So for me, it's like creating achievable goals within the whatever you're doing. Like if you said bring rainbows and people bring rainbows, we have won, right? So, I mean, it's not like we're going to overturn the government at a rally. And I think in my heart, that's <laughs> what I wish would happen. Like I wish it would. But the thing is, my expectations <laughs> and the neighbor who's just coming because they like my dog, right, are totally at different polarity. So how do you bring that person into what we're and 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 educate ourselves about what we need to do next why we're here it's always educating i think and also i think um i think i shared this with you and and david if i didn't share it with you i will but it's a little video it's three minutes long and it's called how to start a movement and it's about the crazy dancing guy have you seen that it's incredible and it's this crazy dancing guy who because he's dancing crazy brings people in and makes the people that are dancing with the crazy guy feel like they're part of it and they're dancing, but it becomes this movement of people dancing. And that's the image I like to use is like, you're coming to be part of something, right? You're coming, you're coming to where a place where we can win and we can feel that win and we can feel that joy because over there, if you're going to like not do anything or you're basically saying you support these guys. Right? So I think, it's the idea to build momentum. It's the idea to make people have achievable goals and also make feel they're doing something, right? Like the worst thing is you have a list of 300 people and you don't have anything for them to do. And they're going, well, why would I even fight this fight? Because, you know, but then again, you have to think like David, when they were talking, they were talking about, um, you know, people that, you know, didn't come, didn't know what to do. And yes, the educating, educating. But I think, you know, you have to realize that people coming is fantastic, but they're not going to always be willing to take the risk. So you have to create a space that we're drawing, we're singing, we're, we're, you know, doing stuff to get our message out that doesn't involve yelling across the street at these haters, because what does that do, right? I don't think it does too much, but uh, it helps if you can get to call somebody an asshole, but that doesn't help, right? Um, so yeah, so I don't know if those are, that's my exhaustive list of things to do, but there's a few things I hope I got across in there. Well, I really like the metaphor of dancing, right? Cause I think the psychology around dancing is actually very similar to the psychology around organizing, 
right? Like, I don't know who's ever been at an event and like, you know, people are like, oh, I need that liquid courage to dance or people, there's just so much of those internal blocks people have around taking that step to be publicly doing something different. Like that's what dancing is, like moving your body, like, and, and not knowing how, and all those little blocks that people, that prevent people from just being free and moving and taking that risk. And I think those same blocks are the same blocks we deal with, with the risk of, you know, going out and saying, <laughs> saying something great, like saying something great about your community, that it's time for something change, that people who are being marginalized deserve better than what they're getting, right? Like, I think those psychological blocks are the same. And, and I think then the idea about creating the space that allows people to work through those blocks easier and faster is what, like, you know, is very helpful. The idea of creating the environment to allow people to take risks that they might not be able to take. They might've not thought they would to do things. They might thought, not have thought they could have done on their own, but you have created a space mm-hmm. that makes them feel like they can. Yeah. I think as a queer man, like just going to that. say a gay bar, right? You're queer and you got to go into a gay bar. That's a risk. You got to like, you know, dress up nice. That's a risk. You got to go on the dance floor and, you know, do it right. That's a risk. So I think, you know, being queer <laughs> And looking for this community that exists, you know, from Northern Ontario, you go, oh, my God, I'm so grateful for these moments. I'm so grateful to be with my people. I'm so grateful to dance with them and laugh and have a good time. And and maybe the rallies and all this stuff is creating an opportunity for this space that is that space or could be that space in the future. Right. Like we could all be dancing together. We could all like nobody wants nobody not to dance. Right. However, they can do it. But I think that, yeah, the risk to go into those spaces, we have to make sure it's as low as it can be and people understand if there is a risk, what that risk could be, you know, because there are risks. And that's why you create these safe spaces. You say, listen, you're going to be yelling at people. You might know your next door neighbor who's on the other side. How do we how do we make sure that's not going to happen? Or if it happens, you have some way to deal with it. Well, that leads great into the next question, which is specific challenges for rural communities when it comes to organizing, where if you're in Toronto, for instance, or Montreal or Halifax or Vancouver, there's a degree of anonymity, there's diversity uh, because of the largeness and, and the vast population, whereas in a rural community, there's less safety, less anonymity, uh, you know, People could accost you in the grocery store. Your dentist could be, you know, a hater. So what are some of the specific challenges uh, of rural organizing in rural communities and, and maybe some solutions to that? You touched on a little bit, Roy. I mean, something that I think is common, especially is, and it is growing in, in kind of its challenge, is the kind of insider-outsider dynamic. Um, you know, as we are seeing, especially in the past year, we've seen a lot of more people move into more rural environments than they would, than they would have been in the past. And I mean, when we organized our rally in 2020 in Baden, like there was like everywhere, there was this kind of common refrain that this was just, you know, outsiders coming into the community, like the people from the city coming into the community to, you know, to change our ways. And, um, and that sense of insider outsider thing is something that's really, I mean, it's not accurate anymore because like the rural communities are diversifying and anyone who's there is there. But I think com- finding ways to delegitimize that neighbor, that narrative so that more and more people feel like they can be a part of the community. Um, and, 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 and I think it creates that, you know, it, it makes it easy for others to dismiss and we want it to not be dismissible. Right. And so changing that definition of what is inside and outside is I, I think a big challenge. Um, and you're right. There's a, there's this, I don't know, like family compact, a very tight relationships, especially when it comes to like systems of power. So if you have, if you're in a town and you know, the p- person like, uh, you know, with, with me, it's your mayor, maybe it's the head of your chamber of commerce. I don't know. Like, you know, those, there's some people who, in a position of power who are causing harm through their roles, right? Like the, because of the, there's this real cemented system of re- network of relationships around them um, that can be very hard to um, unwind. And like, 
I don't have full answers to how to resolve these. Like I will say we got rid of that mayor and then in the next election they elect his, like his his community elected a slate of people just to reject what we had done, right? And so clearly we were like made a statement that we made them so frustrated that they had to mobilize in that way, but it's not this it's definitely I think it's going to be an ongoing journey and um the smaller and more um like the less anonymous your community is, I think that does create added risk. So I'm, I'd love to hear more and like learn more from that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I live in a place where our mayor, there's roads and hills and settlements named after them. Like, I mean, these are people, you know, like, it's like knowing, um, you know, Mr. Young is the um, mayor of uh, your town and the main street in the town is named after him. So it's like, you know, if you have a Fitzgerald running for council, that's a dog, they'll win, right? Like, I mean, it's just the name recognition around here. And even if you lived here like yeah. 30 years, you're not local. Local people basically are born here and their grandmothers are from here. So like you are, you are like not part of the scene if you're not from here. Of course, you know, like Dave's saying, there's more people moving here. Um, but again, like, it's just like the city where, you know, they've got their mortgage to worry about. They've got their family to worry about. They've got the winter to worry about. And so, you know, it, 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 there's this belief, oh, this new influx of ideas and stuff like that. A lot of people are exhausted. They come here and it's to relax, right? So to get them motivated is hard. And also, like, social spaces, like, we don't have them. Like, those third spaces people talk about libraries basically right so your library is the center in these rural places and um so circling back to when you asked me about activism what sparked things so when i first moved here i was going holy fuck i love it here but there are like a lot of pushback on anything progressive here like it just like i came because it was a progressive community but that progressive community is like limited in its scope right but i love them wonderful um, so the thing at the library is the, uh, somebody on staff was telling me it's not the best place to work. And I went, okay, let's deal with this. So the, the, the head of the library, she decided that because she didn't like coffee, she was going to get rid of the coffee, you know? So you couldn't go to the library and have a coffee. And I was going like, you know what? We live in a rural place. The library is the only place where you can go, where you don't have to pay for anything. So if you can't go and have a coffee in rural Ontario when it's 30 below where you can go and have a coffee with your friend, you don't have to have the heat up and spend money. You don't have to do any. There's a fireplace in our library. Sit around the fireplace. Talk to your friend. She took away that coffee. And I made a big stink about it. Bring coffee back to the library. It was all over social media. It was in the paper. And it coffee got back. But that was a really small, small sort of like um, thing that uh, I could do in this community when I first started. Right. But I think also the church, the church is really strong here, like evangelical church. I think Bancroft has more churches per capita than anywhere in Canada. Right. So you have all these evangelical people on council, you know? So I think those are some of the problems with uh, like rural areas. The, the idea too, that isolation, like to get anywhere, to meet anybody, you, there's no public transit. You have to take your car. If you don't drive, you're unable to drive. You can't go. There's divisions between like young people and old people because we skewer toward old. So we don't, we've never had the po the opportunity to bring young people in because it's like a different world sometimes and we don't have the links to those young people. And, and especially if you're queer, you know, we were, there was a queer group started and it's like, Oh, we can go and pick them up. Well, imagine a queer person who's in the closet going, I'm going to go and jump in this car with this old guy and go to my gay meeting, mom and dad. Like, yeah, like it wouldn't happen. So, so how do we do? Like, I like what, like David, I don't have a lot of answers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you build community. You find ways to build community in small ways. And you know what? You make them love you. You make them think, oh, my God, Roy is so much fun. Oh, my God, Roy is so hilarious. Oh, Roy's doing all this great stuff. And then it's like, <laughs> you hate somebody so good as Roy? Fuck you. Like, that's, I think, what yeah, you like. You just have a good time, you know? <laughs> just show them what they could have.
you could have this. I do wonder. Are I'm you like, having a good time with like ground up? Because <laughs> we definitely do have good times, and we make sure. Okay, good. Like, actually, I would say the like there's a huge spine of what we do that's just about relationship building work, and and also like reminding us about the joy within this work. I think that's very critical. But I was thinking about like the solution to this, the the insider outsider dynamic, or the, the like. Um, and this is where I wonder, like, if Waterloo Region can has a lesson for more rural communities, in that, like, part of the structure of Waterloo Region forces rural communities into relationship with urban communities, right? And so, like, with, I mean, like, when we were organizing our rally, yeah, we were used. The majority of people who showed up were people from the community, but we did have people from the cities come and help. And we also were able to rely on, for example, the academic anti-racism thought leadership of people at the universities locally to help guide us. So we were able to draw on those resources for um, like this idea of thinking, thinking regionally, like allows you to draw on resources and supports elsewhere. And, and I mean, ground up now, we've shifted more to focus more on stuff in the urban core, but we still have a lot of people from the rural communities who are still participating. And I think it's like the idea that, you know, they have, they see what's going on in the world and it might be harder for them to do something in their direct community, but they connect with us. So they're not alone and they haven't a channel to do stuff, um, a channel to act somewhere. Right. Like, you know, and like, and knowing that these things are in relationship, like our, you know, our white supremacist mayor still had to report to the regional council. And so this, the idea of thinking regionally, you know, maybe it's not safe to act here, but you could act at the next community over. I also think of like watching what's been going on with um, Perth Stratford Pride and how they have tried to really lean into the idea of Perth as a region so that, you know, the different communities in Perth um, can, like that queer people across the Perth can connect into different resources and then lean into di like where lean into the strengths where there's strengths and then like lean into protections where there needs to be protections. And so if you watched, I think this past summer's Stratford Perth pride, like, I think it was like, I just, there was so much energy there. And I think it's because of this idea of being able to act as a region to create spaces that were safer for people. And then also places where people can act um, and then connect the resources back to places that are more isolated. So I think, I mean, I know Bancroft's hard, like Hastings County's a really big, big, big community, but even the ability to try and <laughs> lean on those kind of <laughs> regional resources around to make sure that, yeah, there's, there's still mm -hmm. ways to build momentum, even if directly in your neighborhood isn't the best place to do it. Right. And, and that brings up a really good point, I think too, because I think, I mean, it's really hard to be a one issue activist in rural Ontario because you're an activist. And so like you don't have the ability to say, oh, yeah, I'm the chair of this group that is dealing with this one specific issue. That's so no, no, you have to be at every you have to be at <laughs> least seen to support those groups. Right. Because like if you just sit at home and going, I'm only going to gay rallies. You might go to two rallies in the 10 years you live here, right? Because there's not going to be that many. But if you go to the rally to support yeah. indigenous people, maybe they'll show up to your rally, you know? Maybe they'll see that you support them and, and want to be part of it or at least give you the support. So I think that it's exhausting in rural areas because you have to create not only your areas to play in, you have to create your areas to fight in, you have to create your areas to learn in. And it's it's a little different from an urban setting where you have access to all of these resources, right? All of these people. So I think, you know, again, we live in a beautiful area, take sustenance from the world we live in and move. But I mean, it can be exhausting. And I think that's a point that I, you made me realize, David, when you were talking about connecting these groups, because it's really important, right, to do those things. Like I'm trying to get the art gallery and the theater people involved here because they are the ones that, you know, could link to other groups that aren't necessarily even know they could be on side with us, right? Like, it's like spreading mm -hmm. out, you know, and, and so that you don't have to deal with a lot, because it is a lot if you consider yourself a leader or an organizer. Yeah, I think 
Building those relationships are really important. Uh, that was going to be a question and you led right into it. So that's amazing because it is true. I mean, you're closer to a bigger city, perhaps, and maybe there are resources, like you mentioned, David, that especially universities, universities have research, evidence, you know, things like that, where they can, they can help your case. They can help build statistics for social media posts and things like that, or anything, anything like, I mean, the sheer uh, network that a university has even. Um, speaking of networks, uh, I know social media uh, can be a great organizing tool, uh, but it can also cause a lot of harm to specific communities because uh, as we know, uh, people who are against progress perhaps also utilize social media platforms. Uh, I wondered what your thoughts, both uh, both of you are, uh, on building, number one, and organizing, but also, you know, communicating. Is it the best form of communication or, you know, what do you think is the best form of communication? How do you, how do you utilize social media or do you have a love-hate relationship with it? Yes. I mean, <laughs> go right. I loved your reaction. Uh <laughs> All right. So also social media is changing, right? To say we understand social media where it's constantly, you know, like different apps, different things, different like so and it's also who controls social media, right? So it's like when you're talking about when you're trying to get information on say Palestine and what's happening there, you have to realize Meta is not maybe your best friend, right? So you have to be aware of the social media and where it's coming from. Um also, I find it the last thing we organized, I said, let's not use social media because of those things about other the haters getting involved. And but there, it, social media is a lot of work, right? You have to put the post up. You have to have the anxiety over who likes it, who shared it, who commented on it. Are the comment? Do we have to delete this comment? Oh, God, are they going to know? Are they going to organize? We organized this thing by email and it was magical. It was so magical. Here's an email with all the information. Send it out to people you know. If they have any questions, get back to me, but we'll see you all there. I didn't know how many people were going to show up. I didn't know if it would be a success. I didn't know, you know, people would say I'm coming. I'd feel really good. But I knew that all of this A, organizing, all of this like planning was done away from social media. It was so refreshing because I wasn't worried. I wasn't like, oh my God, who put that post up? Oh, 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 yeah, is it work sense? So it was like wonderful to use. But living rurally, where media is so sparse and questionable, and now even with like Facebook not allowing news stories on the pages, it's a good question. I don't have an answer. I, I say use it if you can, but be very aware that other people see it, other people use it. It causes anxiety. It causes distractions in a way, because if somebody starts talking about something you don't even want to talk about, you have to kind of address it or delete it. It's, and it's a small town too. So you're like, oh my God, there's crazy Joe again, putting his crazy fucking shit about G4. What am I going to say? G5, like, you know, I don't want to organize that. I want to organize fun. I don't want to be your nanny. So, I mean, I love email. I love email. I, that's how I'm going to organize. It's like old school phone tree, which I love. So I can't say, I mean, I, David, when I was listening to him on the podcast, I thought he had, they had some really amazing points on, on just posting and stuff that I, that made me say, I want to talk to them. I want to talk to them. So I'm really excited to talk to them now, to talk to you now, David. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and I'd love to know what you think, because you have some great insight. So what do you think about social media? I mean, Ground Up started just as a Twitter account. And in many ways, that's really all ground up is <laughs> like in some ways there's a, um, and I see like, you're right that the social media train is evolving really rapidly right now. Like, I mean, whatever X or whatever they're calling it is, has kind of shifted a lot. Meta has, is not allowing news. So there's a lot of real big challenges, I think in the current moment, and we're definitely in transition, but. I think, you know, I think the idea is that like people, like people want to know what's going on. And so like there are people, people everywhere around the community are trying to 
follow things that they care about, things that are important to them, things that are happening. Um, and so I do think that's where I was saying, like, there's, we have to, we should expect that there actually is people out in there in the community who care and want to help and want to get involved. And they are hunting for this information and we just have to find the best way to get it to them. Right. Um, and so what that will look like, I think will evolve. Um, one of the things I liked about social media at the start, like the anonymity of it was really powerful. Um, because you know, it was, we like popped out on the scene and we're just like calling out elected officials for their voting record. And we're just, you know, highlighting issues in the community and, because it was like there was the mystery of what is ground up, who is ground up, what is going on with ground up. Um, and even to this day, like, you know, there are lots of people whose names are now attached to ground up, but because it's the ground up itself is not a person, it's even like we don't, like, it never get, I get way more hate when I do something personally than when I do something with ground up. Like, it's just like, it's, it's amorphousness shields and that protection is very important. I tell people, if you're going to say something controversial, use ground up to do it like i'm like because like you need that protection and and like it, and it's it's valuable because sometimes things need to be said especially in the terms of hostility right like trolls won't bother they don't bother ground up they don't come from ground up but they will come for individuals like and so that protection that social media can provide is very important um but what it looks like now is going to be is evolving i think because of what happened to twitter um, and what's happened to the others. Um, I think, you know, even just, and so this is where me, I, it will depend on where people are at. I think email is a really interesting tool. Um, it is relies on a certain degree of personal relationships. So it's kind of an extension of personal relationships, which are really powerful. But the challenge I think is that like, it's going to be hard then to reach the people who care, who are outside of that right, who are outside of that network, who are isolated. Um, I mean, unless it's a really power pressing issue, then word of mouth spreads things very far in that way. But if things are still at the emerging stage of public awareness, then yeah, I see value in like ha having a place for, it's, it's like a signal, like a bat signal to people who are out searching mm -hmm. online, who are, you know, in a small town or in a like in a on a farm wanting to care and like having lots of feelings um and they they're already there like they're they're searching where they can and so it's just about finding you know and you're not going to be able to find everything right um but i think having a couple like one or two bat signals out there that people can flock to can be very valuable mm -hmm. and we'll see what they look like i'm really very interested in next door as an app um because it, it it's like the most, almost like the social media that's closest to reality or closest to the ground, but it's like terrifying <laughs> because there's a lot of hostility and like actual violence, like in terms of like people calling the cops on their neighbors and on homeless people and on stuff that happens on that app. But it makes me excited is the idea of like, how do you disrupt that? Um, and so I think lots is possible on social media. I always would say, just don't do it alone. Like get a team you know, get a buddy, get a partner, get someone you can tag team it and pick a social media and throw a bat signal in there and see what happens. Cause you're going to find people and where, wherever you go, you're going to find people and then build that, but just don't do it alone. I think when you do it alone, it, it, it will destroy, <laughs> like it is soul crushing, um, but having it be a kind of collective project, maybe there's a bit of a anonymity that you can rely on to protect you. I think that, um, yeah, I think that's probably the best strategy for social media. Yeah, I've used That's it. awesome advice, David. And so building on that. Oh. I have a question, though, that comes out of that. <laughs> Could I ask my questions of okay. David? Go ahead. Uh, another thing I find, too, with of social course. media and, and what social media, do, and I apologize for my dog barking. That was my dog. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you find out you become the voice, right? You become like the people will like hear. I'll say to the reporters, please talk to other people. <laughs> like I, these are, they're as eloquent as I am. They can give you, you know, all the things like, because you become this kind of like leader, um, this uh, assumed leader, which is fine. I mean, I don't mind leading stuff, but the thing is you have to make people understand that you're, it's more than you, right? It, and it, it, and it is mm -hmm. more than you. 
but uh, but sometimes media is lazy. And if you live in a small town where you develop relationships with the media, they're going to call you even if they don't know what's happening. They'll call you for what's happening. And so you have to always be careful in rural areas that you're not you don't become the voice of the movement. You know, you can you can talk, of course, everybody should. But the thing is, like, it's the other day I was at the theater in downtown Bancroft and um, somebody said I heard somebody over call, call me, call me Rainbow Man. And they didn't mean it in a nice way. It was like, oh, there's that queen that's always trying to get the rainbow flag in our lives, shoving it down our throats. You know, like, why do they have to shove it down our throats? And she was young and she wanted to be cool. And I think her saying that was kind of like, it was dismissive. So I was like, okay, girl, I don't mind being called Rainbow Man. I think it's beautiful. So I said to her friend who doesn't know that I know, I said, who was that woman that called me Rainbow Man? That was so sweet. Tell her thanks. And that gets back to her because I don't know why I'm, where I'm going with this, but just don't try and be the leader of your community. You be the leader and you get it. Throw the leader, but don't throw your shit around. Try and get other people to throw their shit around. And it'll happen. Anyway, sorry, yeah. sorry. That was just something I want to add. I mean, oh. this is... <laughs> but I think the question around <laughs> the like leader thing, um, I mean, this is one of the reasons like we were we were, we started in, like as an anonymous group because I I didn't want it to be about me, right? Like, it's like, I'm, I'm literally no one special. <laughs> I have no better analysis than anyone else. I am no expert in any thing. Um, and so it's like, and I don't want, like, I also to be very mindful of like the, the traps, like, or just, yeah, the traps of ego, like, like, you know, I see happens with politicians all the time and even like influencers get caught up in all that stuff. Um, and I'm like, we're trying to act like the goal is to mobilize people and move people. Um, so, uh, but you know, I, just, I mean, I'm, I'm the, I'm always the one doing podcasts. I'm often the one doing re interviews. Um, I try and frame it in the lens of like, I have a specific role, right? I am founder and I can, that's a role. So I can speak as like, you know, no one has the knowledge that I do because I started the bullshit back in the day, you know? So that's like a specific role I can speak from. And, you know, or if, it, if there's a specific action, I can play the role of media liaison because I know the like bullshit tricks that journalists play and know the <laughs> tactics. And like, and, and so I'm like, I'm framing like my, this is my role. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not the expert, but I'm playing this role. It's either to speak from my experience as the founder or it's cause I am playing this role of media liaison. And so maybe I think leaning into roles as another way, um, to, as another way to do that and being very direct with like, you know, journal, <laughs> you need to bully journalists a little bit, like, you know, cause they are so frustrating. So, uh, you know, just don't get, let them take, take your power. That's another thing. <laughs> You know, people don't realize that you have the power, that the person who is the subject of the interview actually holds power. And mm -hmm. journalists want you to think that you don't hold any power, but you do. You hold all the power. You can say, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. And that pisses them off. Um, <laughs> getting back to, I, and I want to kind of close things out a little bit. You both have so much knowledge and I'm so grateful. Um, there is someone listening or, or a group of people in different small communities in BC and PEI, and they don't have any organized group uh, for, you know, any kind of protests, any kind of subject, any kind of issue, but they want to. And they want to rally the people in their community. Uh, David, you mentioned, you know, having a, a beacon online, but what can they do? How can they start? Uh, to mobilize others in their community and 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 create a group. What's both of your advice? I'm going to go to uh, David first. Yeah, um, I would say first things first. Like, if you are anyone in southwestern Ontario, you can contact Ground Up. You just for like you know, because I think that's why I, I see. Waterloo region as this gateway into all of Southwest Ontario. And I want 
So anyone in Southwestern Ontario to know that like you can talk like you know you we're we're not that far away and we can you we can you can borrow our resources and our and come for advice like please don't be a stranger um because I'd love to spark seeds and transform everything that's possible in Southwestern Ontario. But I literally like I think you just need one person um and to be your like and that's and then you're you're and then you're organized and you're a thing and like and it can be and I like I like I literally play into the drama of it being like once you create a thing it's bigger than you like it's not about you anymore you and your whoever your person are and you know you have created something that lives it's an idea that lives far greater than you can be and so you just need that one person to support you and then I think um a lot of it it's like just like taking risks you know and knowing that like a lot of the information is out there in terms of like you know marginal if, if you are like if you are a white person listening to this and you want you're like oh like i hear racism in my community and oh maybe we should wait like you know but i'm i'm no expert and blah blah blah, blah. like there are scholarship and there are activists across canada who are very very clear and what they want from white people and so you don't have to be an expert you just have to act on what those calls to action are and you know and 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 the idea of doing like you don't have to be perfect before you do just start doing and things can come from that so i really encourage people to you know take some risks people will come out if you put out that signal like if you create this idea and you put it on your community you will there will be other people who will want to help and who will, will want to get involved in that and then um yeah try and take some risks and like if we think of like and like be name name the like name the reality of risks like what is it what is a risk actually R like you know so like the risk is you know maybe the risk is having to deal with tensions like relationship tensions you know com like you know having to people um in your neighborhood in your community hate you or be mad at you and i think it's like really sitting like is that like what is what is that risk actually mean and do you have the tools to navigate it? Does that risk actually act matter? You know, like I've taken some really, really big risks. People said they were, and like they literally, some of them literally didn't mean anything, right? It's just this idea of a risk. But some of them are very complicated, especially relationship ones are very complicated. But you have so much power and tools as a person to navigate those things as well. So um, I just, I give you the blessings of courage to try things, see what happens. Um, and, um, and like there are organizers across the, the world that you can learn from. You can even ask direct questions. If you send an email to groundup.wr at gmail.com, someone from my network can can give you some advice. Like, like you're not alone. Um, and so I, I hope you find their power. And like I was on, like I did nothing. And then three years ago now I'm doing tons, <laughs> like tons of stuff. So like, <laughs> like and that's not, that, that's a tiny, like, you know, I feel like everyone now looks at me as like, I'm the master organizer. I'm like, no. <laughs> I just stumbled and failed for three years and now I'm here. And so you stumble and fail and you will become, and you will learn skills and you will find community and things will happen no matter what. Right. So I just send you blessings of joy. You are worth it. And um, yeah. No, that's wow. great. Great advice. And Roy. <laughs> All right. So person out there listening, li listening in rural Ontario or rural anywhere or city, I love you. And, um, I want to tell you um, to not just go for your cause, right? Like you might see a cause over there where you want to get involved in. That's great. But also get involved in your community. Like there's a library. Is there a book club? Get a book you want to read. Get other, one other person to meet at the library. That's visible. That's, people are going to see that the Palestinian authors group is meeting at the library. That's radical, right? They're going to see it. It's not, or maybe you're reading fantasy. I don't care, but people are seeing you volunteer at the food bank, volunteer at the skating rink where kids are skating, like get out there and be part of your community. And then when you ask people to come to the rally, they're going to say, yeah, why wouldn't I? You help, you know, my kid skate, you know, like they know you, you become somebody who's known. And I wouldn't trust anybody who said to me that I didn't know, come to this rally. I'd go, why? What would I go? What are you doing? Why would I go? Right. Um, so that's the first thing I would say would be get involved and 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 
it doesn't have to be big. It could be, you know, people need you at the food bank, the charity thrift store. There's lots in rural Ontario that you can get involved in, right? It could be helping your neighbors, right? Like throwing a, a, a Halloween party. I don't care, but people should know you. If you want to lead these things, people should know you. Um, and in small rural areas, it's, it's easy. Also, plan to enjoy yourself. You know, as hard as it is in, plan to have a good time. Plan to know that these people are good people and they want to have a good time too, right? So it's hard. You'll have hard conversations maybe, but the thing is you'll be breaking bread with these people. You'll be, you know, supporting them. You'll be doing stuff to help build your community. At the bottom line for me, it's building community. Because when you have community and they know you're supported, when sorry, when you, when you know you're supported, when you know you have people there, it's much easier to take those risks. It's much easier to organize. It's much easier to support other people doing stuff because you're building momentum, right? I think that's the most important thing. How do you build momentum? Like if you did a rally yesterday, think about what you're going to do tomorrow. And maybe it won't be a rally. Maybe it'll be just like a, you know, we live in a beautiful area full of trails. Go for a walk, organize a walking group that's going to walk and talk or maybe silently meditate or whatever. But the thing is, there's so much... There's so many things that we need you to do in these small communities that has nothing to do with politics. And then maybe, well, it does. Everything has to do with politics, you ask me. But the thing is, like, get yourself out there, please. Like, that's what you have to do. You have to just get involved. And it doesn't have to be, nobody's judging you on how involved you are, right? You go and help an old lady across the street, you're involved, right? Don't let anybody tell you you're not involved because you're part of a community and you just have to find that and build it. That's my advice. I'd give you more, but wow. we'll be here all day. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I have about 100 more questions for both of you. But for now, I really appreciate all of your advice. Uh, very grateful for your insights and your experience and, and your grace as well um, with yourselves and with your organizations. So thank you both so much. And uh, I bid you farewell. Could I, before we go, could I say what we're going to do next? Because it involves David and podcasts. Sure, of course. Yes. And maybe it'll, maybe it'll inspire okay. people to do what we're doing. So anyway, like I said, I live in sure. rural Ontario and we, involve, we organized this art in where we had all these people organized by email and show up and beautiful, loving event. So what do we do with all that momentum, right? I'm going, oh my God, like we have all these emails. We have all these people. And then I was listening to podcasts and I heard David speak. And when they were speaking, they said great things that we didn't even cover in this this podcast that we could have part two. Um, and I said, David, would you come and speak to my community about what you're doing with Ground Up? Because we need to build. We need to give people candy. Right. And so, David, they were great. They said, sure. So anyway, I send it out to people. Great idea. Wonderful. OK. And so that's the next step out of this great thing we did in the art in that the momentum is happening and it's not big we're all gonna meet talk about what ground up is how they organized it what's the purpose what they're doing next what we're going to do next and it just builds momentum so i want to thank you for bringing chana for bringing david and me together so we could organize this event more and um and thank david for all <laughs> the work that they're doing and all the work that you're doing shauna so thank you so much it was lovely to meet you david here and continue to work and talk to you, Shauna. You're an inspiration. So thank you. Yeah, much gratitude. And bro, I didn't even realize you were from Bancroft. That's like my favorite part of the province. I will drive to your event. Like I will be there. You will? <laughs> Yay! Oh, awesome. Oh my That's God. Great. You could stay here. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I spent a decade of my summers working in summer camp up there. So I love Bancroft a lot. Okay. We, we're going to plan Very even more, exciting. David. There you go. More plans. <laughs> you know, okay. maybe we should have like a town hall. Why don't you guys plan a town hall and we'll do some big virtual town hall, how to organize. Well, that's something Ground Up is Amazing. looking to do something in that area. Um, <laughs> so I will let you know if we move, if when, when things come together. It's always evolving. Things are always so flexible and fluid, but... That is the intention is to let's, move in that direction next. Let's get our thing down first, okay. David. Well, thank and then you we'll, both. We'll take over the world. <laughs>